Hello to the all. I hope they are well. I hope they are surviving and thriving as much as you can, as much as God is willing you to do, as God has planned for you to do. I hope you're having a blessed day wherever you are on this big and beautiful and grey and depressing earth. Today we're going to talk about love and we're going to talk about God's love. And how do we know that God loves us? Well, we're going to find out in this video. One way that we like to show one another love is through gifts. We like to give each other gifts as a sign of our love and our affection and our peace towards one another. We also like to give gifts to one another to rekindle our relationship or to start our relationship. If, I, if you're a stranger and I go over to you and I give you a gift, then that starts a friendship. It starts a relationship through a gift. And that gift has to be sacrificial. Because if I was to give you, let's say, a box of chocolates that was only worth like nine pounds or whatever or, or, or nine bucks then it's not going to be much of a sacrifice but if i buy you a brand new house or a brand new car then you're going to pay attention because it's sacrificial i love you so much as to sacrifice all of that money and time in order to get you that house or that car so depending upon uh, the value of the gift it will influence how the receiver treats the one who's giving the gift the concordant uses the word of an approach presence, which is a lot more detailed than just saying it's a gift. The definition of an approach present is a gift that's offered for the purpose of provoking in the receiver, now pay attention to that, kind inclinations towards the giver, thus acceptance. So, of course, if I was to go up to you and I was to hand you a gift, the entire purpose of that gift is to rekindle or to reconcile or to build up on our relationship. And in scripture, it's used for a sacrifice for sin, for a peace offering, or, of, or a present or a gift. I'll use an analogy to help explain. Let's say you're at a birthday party and let's say I'm one of your friends and let's say you have an another friend named Bob and we both come to you with gifts. I come to you with a box of chocolate and Bob comes to you with a brand new house. Who are you going to be more appreciated of? Who's showing the sign of love here? Is it me who's sacrificing just a box of chocolates or is it Bob who's sacrificing an entire house or an entire car just for you? He did all that just for you and that's how much he loves you. And let's say before he gave you that gift, you were angry with Bob. And in fact, the entire purpose for him to give you this house or this car, this sacrificial gift, is so he can bridge an estrangement between you and Bob. That's the entire purpose of why he's doing it. This is why an approach present has to have great value. It can't be something like a box of chocolates. It has to be something of great value. It has to be sacrificial, because if it wasn't, then you're not going to care, and it's not a loving action the sacrifice would not be worth all that much. A really good example of an approach present, and in fact the first time that it appears in scripture, is the story of Cain and Abel. And of course we all know the story. Both Cain and Abel had an approach present, or a gift, for God. Cain brought God a basket of vegetables, which it was isn't worth all, all that much. I mean, what, if you have some carrots and some lettuce, it's not worth that much. And then you compare it to the sacrifice of Abel, who brought God an approach present of the firstling of his flock, which I think could be a lamb. Now, which one is worth more? The firstling of the flock and their fat, or the vegetables? Of course, it's the firstling of the flock. So that's why God accepted his sacrifice. He accepted the sacrifice of Abel and not Cain. And the key here is it has to be a sacrificial gift. You're sacrificing a lamb or you're sacrificing a goat or whatever it was what, what Abel was sacrificing to God. It's a physical alive being. It's of great value. If you compare that to the vegetables, the vegetables have value, but it's nowhere near compared to the sacrifice of Abel. This is why God accepted the sacrifice of Abel and not Cain. If you're trying to rekindle or to build a relationship with someone, you're not going to sacrifice something of little value to them. Like the vegetables or the box of chocolates, it has to be a sacrificial thing. Throughout the entirety of scripture, minus Paul's letters, we see that it is always mankind who is approaching God with an approach present. Throughout the entirety of the relationship between God and Israel, Israel was always giving God an approach present. And that came in the form 
of the lambs and the red heifers and the doves and the cattles and vegetables and grain. It was always you or it was always Israel giving something to God so that God could give them favor. And in return, God would forgive them of their sins for the blood sacrifice of the animal or the burning of the food. It could be the lambs and you slaughter the lamb and then the blood will blot out your sins, the sins of Israel. And that was the case throughout all of scripture until it was turned on its head. Let's flip the roles now. This is the approach present of God. God is approaching us instead of us that's approaching God. God is now the giver and mankind is the receiver. And this present, this gift is much like the lambs, except those are a temporary solution for sin. This is a permanent solution for sin. And it's not just for Israel, it's for all mankind. And eventually all of creation will be reconciled back to God because of this sacrifice, because of this gift, this approach present from God to all of mankind. It reveals God's true heart, his unconditional love and grace towards all, and it saves all mankind from sin and death. Of course, I'm referencing the fact that God's approach present to us, the highest being, the one with the most value, is his son, Jesus Christ. God gave his son for us to show him, to show all of us that he loves us unconditionally. Think about that. Compared to what we just spoke about, how if you wanted to give someone a gift to truly let them know that you love them and that you care for them and to rekindle a, a relationship with them, you sacrifice something of great value. You sacrifice something of great importance and value to them. So that way that you know that we're serious. I'm serious. I want to start a relationship with you. And it did. It was thanks to the actions of Adam that humanity lost its connection with God. And now God is rekindling the relationship via his son's death and tomb and resurrection for our sins. That's his gift to us. That's his approach present to all of us. So let's read some scripture now. So Ephesians chapter two, verse eight, for in grace through faith, and it's the faith of Christ, are you saved? And this is not out of you. It's not out of you. It is God's approach present. And who is God's approach present? It is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And how do we know that the approach present is Christ? Well, let's go into Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. And be walking in love according as Christ also loves you and gives himself up for us, an approach present and a sacrifice to God for a fragrant odor. This fragrant odor is upon us because we died with Christ on the cross. So this fragrance and this smell is beautiful to God. It pleases him. We are, we are holy and flawless in the sight of our God and Father, not because of something that we did, not because we believe to be saved or we put our faith in salvation or because we achieve salvation by our attempts at perfecting the law or whatever it is. It's entirely for in grace through faith are you saved and this is not out of you. It is God's approach presence which is Jesus Christ dying for our sins on the cross that is God's gift that's given to you that's given to me and that's given to all mankind to the believers and the non-believers to the atheists and the Christians to the Mormons and the Jews to the celestials and the animals and all of humanity that is God's gift to everyone God so loves the world as it says in this verse John chapter 3 verse 16 for thus God loves the world, and, no, and notice that it says that he loves the world, as in its present tense. It's not past tense. He's not saying God loved the world, as in past tense. He's saying God loves the world. For thus God loves the world, so that he gives his only begotten Son, that everyone who is believing in him should not be perishing, but may be having life eonian. His, his gift, his approach, his present, to us all is the greatest gift that he could give to us. There's not a greater gift that God could have gave us. That's the highest gift possible. That shows you how much that he really loves us. His blood being spilt for all of sin, once for all time for all of creation, pays off the debt of all of sin for every single person that has ever lived or ever will live. And he accomplished salvation for not only Israel, but for everyone. And this life Eonian is only on 
the body of Christ and the believers of the circumcision. But that doesn't mean that the rest of humanity won't be saved. I'll use an analogy to help explain. Let's say I'm at a birthday party and let's say I invite you all to my birthday party because you're my close friends and I extend an invitation to you because I love you so much. So you get to come to my birthday party first. We get to celebrate for two whole days, let's say, with the cake and the balloons and things like this and it's great. But after those two days, the rest of humanity, the rest of my family, and the rest of the people that live in my town or village, let's say, they all get to come to the birthday party too. Just because I invite you to my birthday party first does not mean that the rest will not come in. For God is the saviour of all mankind, especially of believers, not exclusively of believers. All of mankind come into my birthday party, but especially of my best friends. They get to come in first. They get the VIP pass. They get to enjoy it before anyone else. That does not mean that the rest will not be saved, for God is the saviour of all mankind. And he proved that via sacrificing his son, his approach present for all mankind, for all mankind's sins once for all time. That's how much he loves us. And that special salvation for the believers in the body of Christ involves the reconciliation of all of creation back to God. That's amazing. That's a special package for the believers. But the rest of humanity, they have a package too, which involves salvation because God loves them too. And he's going to reconcile the rest of humanity back to himself when he uses the believers who he pre-designated in Christ to be conformed to the image of his son, to be the complement of his son, to reconcile the whole thing back to him. And this is all accomplished via his son's death and tomb and resurrection for our sins on the cross. That is his approach present that you cannot change. It's a finished work on the cross that you cannot add to, you cannot take away from. You can't add to it with your works of the flesh or your works at keeping the law or your free will or your faith. It's entirely for in grace through faith are you saved. It is not out of you. If it was your free will choice or if it was your works, then it would be out of you. And scripture just clearly states that it is not out of you. It is God's approach present, his gift towards all mankind, to the believers and the non-believers, every single one. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14 to 15. Now thanks be to God who always gives us a triumph in Christ. It's not a triumph of ourselves, it's a triumph in Christ. And it's manifesting the odour of his knowledge through us in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God. That's because we're a part of him. We're the body of Christ. We're the body of the Son of his love. And we died with him on the cross and we were resurrected with him also, we are a fragrance of Christ to God. When he looks at you, he does not see a sinner. You are holy and flawless in his eyes, despite of your decaying flesh. Holy and flawless and unimpeachable in the sight of God, because you are justified, declared not guilty from all of your sins once for all time. You have been given God's own righteousness. When he looks at you, he sees a son. He does not see a sinner. He sees a son. You are fragrance, a beautiful smelling, ple you are pleasing to God. You are pleasing in his eyes. Think about that. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God in those who are being saved and in those who are perishing. Colossians chapter 1 verse 21 to 23. And you being once estranged and enemies in comprehension. We were all estranged from God. We were all outside blind and deaf and dumb by God himself, so that he can reveal the mercy to us, so that he can reveal his grace to us. And he can't do that if we're perfect, if we just never sinned. We were made this way. We were made perfectly imperfect, flawed by design, so God can reveal his transcendent grace to us. And he does that via his son's death and tomb and to resurrection for our sins, his approach present, his gift. He's giving us everything. Every single thing that you can even imagine plus infinity. You can't even comprehend what God is giving us through his son. His son had to die for our sins. And he sent his son to into the world in order to do that. And he knew that. That's his perfect faith that saves us. We have no faith unless God grants us faith. It's a miracle to have faith. No one has faith. It's not like a muscle that you can flex. God has to give it to you. It's the perfect faith of Jesus Christ and his Father that saves us. He is the gift 
from God to all of creation, his approach present. It's not like a bar of chocolate. It's not even a home. It's not even a car like a fancy new BMW. This gift is the greatest gift imaginable. The greatest gift that you could even conceive of is even greater than that. The greatest gift to anyone to prove to them how much that you love them is to sacrifice your only begotten son, the one who never sinned. And he was treated as if he did sin. He died for our sins on the cross. He became sin and we died with him. And God accepted this perfect sacrifice for sin. It's not just like an animal or a dove now. This is the perfect sacrifice for sin. And do you want to know how God accepted his sacrifice? He resurrected him. And you being once estranged and enemies in comprehension by wicked acts, yet now he reconciles by his body of flesh through his death to present you holy and flawless and unimpeachable in his sight. We are holy and flawless and unimpeachable in God's sight. Imagine if you were to write down every single one of your sins on like a book or like a piece of paper. Every single sin that you've ever committed, past, future, and all the sins that you're going to commit in the future. Write them all down. What forgiveness is, is if God was to wipe the, sl uh, the slate clean. That's what forgiveness is. Now, justification is if he was to take this piece of writing with all of your sins and he was just to burn it. They don't exist now. Forgiveness implies that you can sin again and then he will have to forgive you again. It also implies that you're guilty because in order for me to forgive you of your sins, it means that you're guilty. But justification says you're not guilty. You're not guilty. I burned away all of your sins. It's not being reckoned to you now. You're not a sinner. You are justified in Christ. You're an entirely new creation in Christ. You're holy and flawless in God's own sight and unimpeachable. God cannot condemn you because you are unimpeachable because you are baptized into the death and tomb and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he who dies has been justified from sin. That's really good news. That's the complete opposite of what all the religions in this world will tell you. They try to resurrect the old humanity and get you to perfect your flesh, which is an impossible task because they're locked up into vanity, because they are the agents of Satan. It's ironic that the people who claim to be the preachers and pastors of Christ are really just speaking for Satan. That's ironic. To present you holy and flawless and unimpeachable in his sight. Since surely you are persisting in the faith, grounded and settled, and are not being removed from the expectation of the evangel, which you hear, which is being heralded, and the entire creation which is under heaven, of which I, Paul, became the dispenser. It's the, it's the Apostle Paul who is the dispenser and the Apostle for us in this administration. It's not Mark or Luke or John or Matthew or John the Baptist or Moses or Elijah or any of those guys. It's the Apostle Paul that's our Apostle for today. And this evangel, this gospel, is really good news. If you've been given the faith to believe in this and the death and tomb and resurrection of Christ once for all time, for all of sin, for all of humanity, you're baptized into his death because God gives you the faith to believe in this. You were baptized into his death and tomb and resurrection and you're an entirely new creation in Christ. Nothing consequently is now condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. That is awesome. Salvation has been accomplished for you. For in grace through faith are you saved, and this is not out of you, it is God's approach present, not of works, lest anyone should be boasting. For his achievement are we, being created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God makes ready beforehand, that we should be walking in them. If you believe in this, if you believe this to be true, it means that God has given you the faith to believe it, so you can't even boast in that. That's amazing. And this is what we go out there. We tell to all the world. This is what we will tell them. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For the love of Christ is constraining us, the believers, judging this, that if one died for the sake of all, consequently, all died. And he died for the sake of all, that those who are, that those who are living should by no means still be living to themselves, but to the one who is dying and being roused for their sakes so that we from now on are acquainted with no one according to flesh. Yet even if we have known Christ according to the flesh, nevertheless now we know him so 
no longer. This is the transcendent riches of Paul, the gospel that was given to Paul by Christ. We don't know Jesus Christ according to the flesh now. This is the evangel of the ascended, of the glorified and the risen Christ Jesus. This is transcendent. We don't go into Mark and Luke and John and Matthew. I'm not saying that they're bad. All of scripture is written for us to learn and to study, but not all of scripture is written to us. Paul's 13 letters are the ones who are written to us. So that if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The primitive passed by. Lo, there has come new. Yet all is of God who conciliates us to himself through Christ. God is at peace with us. And we are now at peace with God because God has justified us. He's enlightened us to the truth of what happens on the cross. Our sins are dead. Our sins were separating us from God. But now our sins are gone. So don't be focused on sin. Sin is a narcissist. It wants you to fixate on, on it. It wants you to try and solve the problem. Well, guess what? Christ did that for you. And we died with him. That's real good news. Yet all is of God who conciliates us to himself through Christ and is giving us the dispensation or the evangel or the message of the conciliation. How that God was in Christ conciliating the world to himself and not reckoning their offenses to them and placing in us and the believers the word of the conciliation. That God is at peace with you. He's at peace with you regardless of what you've done in this life. I don't care how bad that you think that you are. I don't care if you're Hitler. I don't care if you're Stalin. I don't care if you're Joe Biden or Donald Trump or, or, or Ted Bundy. I don't care who you are. God is at peace with you. Not because of anything that you ever did. God is at peace with you. And he saves his entire creation via his son's death and tombs and resurrection for our sins. And this is what we go out there into the world. And we tell people, God is at peace with you. And how do we know that God is at peace with the entire creation? Well, firstly, God created it. So how can he not be at peace with his entire creation? He reveals this love and this grace to us via his son's death and tombs and resurrection for our sins. It's his approach present. He's revealing himself to us through Christ. And the highest expression of that is his sacrifice. That's what gifts do. They rekindle our relationship. The relationship was broken because of Adam. And now the relationship is coming back because of Christ. It's all God's plan. It's all God's operation. And the entire creation is being conciliated back to God. God is already at peace with you. And the believers are, are at peace with God. We are at peace with God. So we're reconciled back to God. But the entire creation is not at peace with God. It's just the believers. So God is at peace with the creation. But the creation is not at peace with God. In comes the body of Christ. It's our role to reconcile the creation back to God. That's our role. And that will happen in the future. But right now we go out there into the world and we herald this good news. And all the people who have been pre-designated to believe will hear this message and they will be given the faith to believe it. Hence why I'm doing this right now. God has always been at peace with the world. If he wasn't at peace with the world, then he wouldn't sacrifice his son for our sins to reveal his love to us. That's amazing. Can you imagine if you sacrificed your son for... The murderers and sinners and rapists and liars and slanderers of the world. The people who were mocking you constantly. The people who were disobeying you for thousands of years and rebelled against your name all the way since Adam. And you sacrifice your only begotten son for them? For the sinners? For the one who blaspheme you? And they continually disrespect you over and over and over. And you deal graciously with everyone. You do not reckon their offenses against them. You are God. You are so merciful and gracious. Your grace is infinite. You will always super exceed all the sins of mankind. That is a fact. That's how much that he loves us. He gave his only begotten son as a gift, as an approach present. Look, I'm giving you him. That's how much that I love you. Slaying him. Pouring out his blood for the complete justification of sin. And eventually all of mankind will be justified from their sins. They will be baptized into the death and tomb and resurrection of Christ too. This verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 19, how it says that how that God was in Christ conciliating the world to himself is an ongoing process. Eventually all will be conciliated back to God. That's our role. From the human perspective, 
God is now at peace with the world because he sacrificed his son. But from the absolute perspective, he's always been at peace with us. You know, we've got to remember that all is in accord with the counsel of God's will. If he wasn't at peace with us, it's his fault. <laughs> you know, from our perspective, it might seem like that. And I know that a lot of religions teach this, that God had to punish his son in order for him to be at peace with us. Well, that's just from the human perspective. God has always been at peace with us. God is not being conciliated to the world. The world is being conciliated to God, who's always been at peace with us. And proof of that is him sacrificing his son for us. If he wasn't at peace with us, he wouldn't do that. He wants to have a relationship with you. And trust me, he's going to get it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 to 21. For Christ then are we ambassadors as of God entreating through us, through, through the believers. We are beseeching for Christ's sake. Be conciliated to God. Be at peace with God. He's at peace with you. He loves you. Look what he did. Look what he did. He sacrifices his only begotten son that's worth more than the entire creation put together. It's like if he bought you a thousand homes. Can you imagine if someone did if someone did that? Like they bought you a private yacht and an island and mansions and all this money. And they did that just because they wanted to let you know that, that they love you. This is a bajillion times greater than that. <laughs> God loves us all. He's always loved us. He created us. We came out of him. If he was to hate us, he would be hating a part of himself. We are his creation and we all reflect him, the good and the bad. The bad has to be there. The evil and the wickedness has to be there, which is temporary, of course. He will do away with it, but it has to be there so that we can see the good through contrast. The reason why you can see me is because you can see the things around me, which will then you, it will reveal me to you because you can see all the things surrounding me. The reason why you can see the light is because of the darkness that surrounds it. But if there was no darkness that was surrounding the light, then there would be no light because all you would see is light. And then you wouldn't know that the light was light. So darkness has to be so that you can see the light. And eventually the dark will be done away with after the purpose of contrast has been completed. Ambassadors are like diplomats. If you actually look into the Greek at, or into the concordance, it actually says home lawyer. That's what an ambassador is. And we are ambassadors or diplomats of Christ who are being sent out into a foreign nation. Just like a diplomat will be sent out. Like if, like if you're a diplomat for the UK and you get sent to France. That's like what we are. We're the diplomats of Christ being sent out into a world that's full of vanity and depression and evil and suffering. And we're telling them that God is at peace with you. And very, 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 very few people will believe that. I've tried, trust me, I've went out there and I've said, God is at peace with you. And they hate that message. They're like, screw you. You're wrong. God hates me. <laughs> God has already accomplished salvation for all mankind and eventually all will believe. All will be saved from death. We've already all, we, we've already all been saved from sin. And Christ has conquered the curse of Adam at the cross. And all will be reconciled back to God and all will be brought into the new humanity. This is what we tell people. Yes, they will reject you, but we're going to do it regardless. We are ambassadors of Christ. We are the diplomats. We're going to go out there and we're going to herald to them. And we're going to herald to them the approach present of God, which is Jesus Christ, the greatest gift that God has ever given to us. And he's not going to take it back. Once he's given you it, he can't take it back. And he's given his son to everyone. And eventually all will come into that understanding, for this is the will of God, that all mankind be saved and come into a realization of the truth. And they will, because God always gets what he wants, because he's God. We represent God in this world that's full of, of wickedness and crookedness and pervertedness. And God is speaking through us. I'm at peace with you. Hence this gift, hence why I sacrificed my only begotten son for you. God is entreating through us. He's speaking through us. We are the ambassadors and diplomats of God. Think about that. That's amazing. For the one not knowing sin, which is Jesus Christ, he, God, makes to be a sin offering for our sakes, that we may be becoming God's righteousness in him. God made his son the perfect sacrifice which is a permanent one, not temporary like the lambs and the goats and the doves. It's permanent. 
is the permanent sacrifice for sin once for all time for all of creation and is giving his own righteousness to all those who believe, to all those who have been given the faith to believe and eventually all will be given the righteousness of God. But it happens in waves. First it's the, first it's the believers, then faithful Israel, and then on and on and on it goes until eventually all of mankind is baptized into the death and tomb and resurrection of Christ. They all died with Christ and they all enter into the new creation, the new humanity. That's one hell of a gift. And this gift is for everyone. It's not just for one person. Like if I was to give you a gift of a box of chocolates or whatever, like a new t-shirt, it's not just for you. God's gift is for everyone and eventually all will come to understand it. Accepting it is not even a part of the deal. This evangel, this message is not an offer. It's a declaration. God sent his only begotten son to die for our sins in the flesh. This is God's approach present. You can't deny it. It's a historical fact. Not all will have the Ionian life because that is given to the believers, but everyone will be justified from their sins, each in their own class. All will be reconciled back to God and saved from death. They will all become immortal in Christ and all will spend an, an eternity with God himself. That is good news. And the good news all comes from the approach present of God, who is Jesus Christ himself. That is some real good news. God is pleased with us. He looks at you. He is at peace with you. And he looks at the believers and he sees a son. He doesn't see a sinner now. He sees a son. You're holy and flawless in his sight and you are unimpeachable. All of your sins, the huge list of sins that you've ever done, they've been burned away. They don't exist now. You've been given God's own righteousness, justified, declared not guilty, and given his own righteousness, you have been declared righteous. You are made right, and he's not going to unmake you right. So it doesn't matter what you do, you can't lose this. That's real good news. That changes you. That changes your heart, your mind, everything. It changes you. It reveals to you the true heart and the true mind and peace and grace of God Almighty. That is amazing. We have the fragrance of Christ upon us, like a cologne, which is pleasing to God. The fragrance of Christ, he looks at you and he sees his son. Love, grace and peace to you all. I pray that this video has been of a benefit to you. That I pray that it has encouraged you, edified you and done whatever else. I pray that it has been of a benefit to you all. God is at peace with you and God is the saviour of all mankind, especially of believers. And it all comes from the gift, from the approach present of God himself, who is Jesus Christ.